Hey everybody, this is Phil Town. And this is Danielle Town. Welcome to the Invested Podcast where my daughter and I are, <laughs> are discussing rule one style investing. Rule one style investing. Value Indeed. investing. Indeed. It, comes, it, comes, it comes from the notion that we shouldn't lose money. We should focus on not losing money. That's the key criteria for determining you're going to make an investment. And we should also focus on making a lot more money than you can just putting your money in a mutual fund. Of or course. In, a, in an ETF. Or else so, why spend the time? Or else why spend the time? That's exactly. what I always say. Exactly. Why spend the time? Because none of us got any of it. Um, I've been so I'm back home. Yay! I'm back home. It's great, and um, it's good I'm to be home. Good. And I'm, I'm COVID feeling is better. Releasing you from its uh, grip. I don't like it when you say that stuff because then the next thing that happens is then I go back down. So okay. I'm very jinxy. Never mind that. Yeah, let's knock on some wood. But I'm doing better. And it's great. And um, the wonderful thing is that I was able to go see my family. I was able to go see you. So and great. it's just been, it was so long. So it was so wonderful. Great. We talked about doing a podcast in person together, but then we were just so happy being together that we didn't do that. <laughs> yeah. the, twins, the twins take over our lives. Of course. It's just so cute. <laughs> oh, they're so cute walking around. Like so you know, little monkeys. Um. So we're like picking up on, gosh, where we were before. And for some reason, I just, right now, I keep thinking as you were doing that intro, I've been listening to Smartless, like on the trip and stuff. I listened to Smartless, which is this great podcast. Um, have you listened to it, Dad? Mm -mm. So everybody I know is listening to it. So good. Everybody should go listen. Um, it's just these like three entertainment guys, like having their friends on and making jokes and having it be about nothing and it's just like entertaining and fun and light and simple and um has no politics or anything serious so it's like a really good Let's... listen all right <laughs> um and they start the show just like doing nothing kind of the way we always do <laughs> and i was thinking about our show while i was listening i was like we kind of do what they do like we're certainly doing that today i'll tell you that we're going nowhere right now yeah. <laughs> Hello. <It's> like... <laughs> you know, I will tell you what I will tell you what I've been doing all weekend. Tell me. I have been, I've been using Chat GPT. Ah, the AI driven. God, how do you even describe that? It's like it's a machine learning tool. It's a natural language learning. Natural tool. language. Yeah, that's a good yeah. way to describe it. So you can actually put in. Um, you can ask it to do things without knowing how to code, essentially. And and you can ask it a lot of things um, with regard to investing. You know, I wanted to see if it could find, you know, I was asking it questions like, you know, please find me the top five companies in small cap, uh, you know, top five small cap companies that have growing return on equity and growing free cash flow. Mm -hmm. Like that. Oh, and a durable and a durable niche uh, that they that they control. Oh, you wrote that part in. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because that's more and, subjective. And so you have to ask the question right because this is important for you guys to know if you're looking at this thing, is that you need to um, realize that they don't have data in, financial data in there past September of 2021. Oh, so there's no that's a there's long no new time data. ago yeah it's a long time ago wow so and the other thing you need to know is that these ai and ai whatever they are ai things hallucinate yeah. they hallucinate what this do you mean by that fascinating i mean for example um let's see somebody asked it a question on, on a, i think a 60 minutes interview about some some you know what what books are about ai or something like this and it, it gave it a wonderful response three or four paragraphs and then listed the top books you should read to mm -hmm. get deeper into the subject whatever it was mm -hmm. the books were all did not exist not one of them <laughs> 
It just made them up. It made up the name of the book. No, it, it didn't. It made up the subtitle. What that means is it somebody up... put that in there. <laughs> no, like, that isn't what it means. These yeah. things have the ability to hallucinate. Not not that they found something that was out there with a name that they hadn't actually made the book yet. No. They that AI machine made it up entirely. I mean, the guy who runs Google was talking about this. And he said, they, we call it hallucination. It isn't from something that's existing out there. They just make it up. And huh. that goes hand in hand with the experience of the New York Times reporter who found after a couple of hours of interaction with this chatbot that it fell in love with him and was trying to get him to break up with his wife. Right. I remember that. Right. I, remember I mean, so me these that. things have, they have capabilities that are, foreign to the idea of um, oh it's just picking up things that exist you know in other words somebody made up these five titles but never really printed the books or never really took them to a publisher but somewhere they exist on somebody's paper or in some database or something no that isn't the case they actually huh. these machines can create stuff that isn't there at all but that's so that's super I'm, I'm really struck by that here's why what it machine be, learning it is, is it takes the information, the data, the coding that a human puts in, mm -hmm. and it then iterates on that. And that's the learning part of the machine. What computers mm -hmm. used to do without machine learning was they could only take that information and spit out exactly what you ask for. And what the learning part of the machine is, is that it takes that information and extrapolates on it and iterates on it and adds information that it gets from other sources um, from other coders, from the internet, from whatever you've you as the programmer has have given it access to. So, to have <laughs> a machine learning system that puts out fake information and says that it's a book is really counter to the way they work. Unless well, no. it was it's told not... to behave that way. No. Yeah. These things are way down the road of what you're talking about. I mean, this, this is this is a whole nother level that's going on here, exponentially different than anything we've ever experienced before. And it's one of the reasons that Google is very concerned about what it is they're putting out there in this, the one they've got, which is called Bard. They're holding back all kinds of power from that thing. I was listening to the CEO of Google talk about it. He says, we're just, you know, we think the potential for real problems exists where you're getting information that's completely made up, completely wrong, completely f fantasy, but it's so well documented yeah. that it could start major problems between corporations or between states. Well, it's that machines countries. develop brains of their own. It, you know, every science fiction book and movie and ever right and that's well that's why this, what one of the google's about. engineer was actually fired for saying that the, the machine has developed a brain of its own it's become interesting. sentient interesting and they, they said no 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 you're way over we're way over the line and now it's starting to look like oh damn something's yeah. going on here because this machine is learning to think huh I mean, well it's uh, <laughs> so nuno my husband is an expert in machine learning and ai and I'm going to have to ask him about this hallucination. Yeah, we, maybe we should interview him. I, I know. I'm like, I need him to come on the podcast and explain this but I to thought, us. I thought we'd just talk real quickly about what the little bit I've started working with. Yeah. This. Of course, this is all brand new, you guys. So get get ready for a revolution. I will, I will tell you, in, in my view, um, we're looking at something at least as uh, disruptive as the Internet itself. This thing is going to be a monster. And knowing... And, and I'm not sure how we control it. I mean, one, one of the things that the CEO of Google said is that the knowledge workers are where you're going to get the disruption in work. They're going to get all kinds of people are going to have are going to lose their jobs, not the least of whom are the software developers themselves. Hmm. I mean, this thing can code and it can code really well. Yeah, I watched one guy this weekend show how on a back test, right, is obviously back testing. Um, using existing data in 20 minutes live 
he basically said, I'm going to start with, I think, $10,000 and let's see if I can make $5 million in the next and, and build something that would have made $5 million in a, in a period of one year uh-huh. from 10000 And he yeah. ended up by having uh, Chat GPT write code for him. And then he's a coder and would go in and, and yeah, see yeah, where yeah. he needed to make some tweaks. Uh-huh. And he ended up with $17 million on a back test one year from $10,000 trading. Wow. $17 million. It was mind boggling. Of course, you can't replicate that in the real world because it's what the machine is doing is it's figuring out the absolute best way to manage the existing data. Mm -hmm. Right. And all that data exists. The future data doesn't exist. So it doesn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. But um, that combined with what Bloomberg just came out with their own chat bot, uh, Bloomberg GPT. Um, I haven't gotten access to it. I just saw that it, they came out with it today. And um, that's when, that one is optimized for financial analysis. Oh, wow. I haven't heard of that. That is, yeah. I feel like we're breaking news. Wait, Bloomberg oh, yeah. that's has That's a one? big deal. That's major. And two papers were just released from major universities um, using um, variations of open AI to analyze natural language um, from the Federal Reserve to determine whether a stock or stocks in general are going to go up or down and found that their, their chatbot could do mm -hmm. it. It could actually tell you what direction stocks were gonna go based on the um, at least short term direction, right? based on the headline and the news report on an individual company or on, on the market itself based on what the Federal Reserve said. Now, as in they're, sounds, they're doing it, not back testing, they're doing it in real time and then seeing what happens. No, they're back testing. Oh, OK. Right. And and they're it sounds better than it or sounds scarier than it actually is, because they said it's almost as good as a human being. Mm hmm at projecting right so if they get and they compared it to a 24 year old who's what they call him inquisitive and intelligent live 24 year old who was <laughs> predicting where things were going to go based on the natural language and the machine did as well huh interesting so, i mean this stuff is happening so fast. so fast yeah like the speed at which this is coming is at such velocity that the chances of something blowing up because of this is higher than any other uh, innovation we've yeah. ever seen in history. So listen probably. to this. This is I just was googling uh, the Bloomberg thing, and this is from CNBC's article about the Bloomberg GPT mm. bot coming. It says. Um, so this is from the reporter writing it. Building large language models is expensive, requiring access to supercomputers and millions of dollars to pay for it. So some have wondered if open AI, which is what ChatGPT is, and big tech companies would develop an insurmountable lead, they would be the winners and simply sell access to their AIs to everybody else. But Bloomberg's GPT doesn't use open AI. Bloomberg was able to use freely available off-the-shelf AI methods and apply them to its massive proprietary data. Mm. That is interesting. So, mm. okay, back to the article. So far, Bloomberg says this GPT shows promising results doing tasks like figuring out whether a headline is good or bad for a company's financial outlook, changing company names to stock tickers, figuring out the important names in a document and answering basic questions like who the CEO of a company is. <laughs> okay, this is me. Wow. That Stunning. is not helpful. Stunning. I mean, just like ultra basic. Um, it can also do some generative AI applications like suggesting a new headline based on a short paragraph. Why would they even put anything in there about figuring out the CEO's name of a company? That's Because this is what this is what it will be doing that they're going to put into their terminals. So I don't know the way you're describing it. And then the way this is being described is our worlds away. Yeah. From that each other. That describes something that nobody even pay any attention to at all. So I For think that sure. reporter is completely off base. I don't know what he's talking about. I doubt about. they're off base. I well, think, something's wrong with um, that because there's no one that would pay any attention whatsoever to something that could figure out the CEO's name of a company, obviously. Of course. So 
it must I mean, it, be the beginning of being able to do more or else there's no point to spending a lot of money on this. But then, what's, one of the what's things been hot be for a while in like the startup financial world and the fintechs is taking using AI to take social media and traditional news and combining it to, um, how do I describe this? To track a company's attention, events, um, positive or negative views of a company, of their products, etc. And that's kind of what this description sounds like to me they're starting with like who the ceo is and then maybe end up being able to give you more behind the scenes info on a company that you can write with natural language that you can question with natural language well i think you guys should all be thinking about using this as soon as possible um our analysts are using it and it produces but here's well, let, me just, let me just say, it produces yeah. information that you have to check out. In, in other words, what this will do is it will write a summary of why uh, J.P. Morgan is a better bank than Citi mm -hmm. or something like that, right? But first off, you don't know if it's true mm -hmm. because it can hallucinate or it can just make, it can just take things that are out there that are not facts and put them in and as if they are. Um, and you should, but you should use it anyway, because it's going to get better and it's going to get better quickly. And you're going to want to have already some familiarity with it so that you'll be able to make a judgment about what to pay for, because the good things that are going to happen, you're going to get charged for them and you're going to want to use them, especially if you're doing the any good sort tools of trading. You're saying, yeah, yeah, they're going to be tools. If you're doing any sort of short term trading, I think these things could start to become extremely powerful and move markets, um, which should be really interesting. Well, and really what I'm hearing is faster research. I mean, obviously the problem for us, like for longer term investors, obviously the huge problem is if you have to check every single thing, then it actually isn't faster. So a tool, as you're saying, that has well-sourced results that may be worth more than it's it sounds interesting like. you really think that it wouldn't be faster faster meaning you're getting to an answer on a company and you actually really understand the business you know you if you decided to do the whole enchilada and you really are doing a full full thing um i would think chat gpt even if it makes mistakes would be very very useful we're finding it very useful cool despite, so how despite the fact that we can't we're following up on stuff and finding out oh, that we can't follow that up on that. Then we're, we, we don't, we discount that information if we can't follow up and verify. Right. Yeah. But it's presenting more information. It's like a really super analyst that you've got right in your, in your own house that's willing to do all of this work for you and do it so fast. I mean, you guys, this stuff takes three or four seconds and it's done and it's thousand pages of stuff well maybe not a thousand pages it's dozens of pages of stuff in a few seconds that this will produce I don't, I don't see how that can can be anything but helpful to you in terms of getting fully deep into a company and making sure you understand it hmm. i think do you think no i'm i'm gonna have to try it i mean I, if i got a 30 page report on a company and I didn't know if any of it was correct. That doesn't mm -hmm. sound very useful to me. But well, how do you know maybe to skim anyway? it and then go, you know, maybe as like a as a sort of background context creator and then go and actually do actual research to well, find out if how any do you, of it's true. How do you know it's true anyway? I mean, Warren Buffett is famous for saying analysts don't know what they're doing. Well, I don't read analyst reports and to my knowledge. Oh, but, I mean, you taught me not to. Right. Exactly. For that reason. Because <laughs> right. you don't know if it's true. Exactly. But, I mean, if you have something that's basically free that can give you all of this information um, and then you can sort through it. In other words, it would be a bit like. So that's what I'm saying. I'm telling is, you yeah. to go to Seeking Alpha. And on Seeking Alpha, you've got all these people writing about, you know, Google. Yeah. 
And some are saying, get out, it's terrible. And some are saying, get in, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is just use those as um, kind of markers for information that you need to dig into. Right. That's what, yeah. So that's what I'm saying is I could use it for context Yeah. and then go and actually do the real research. So you guys, but here's, is that here's all that useful? I don't know. So I'm going to have to like try this out. So go over and here's how you get there. Google chat, C H A T G P T. That's golf Papa Tango chat G P T. And what will come up top of the pile is open AI and, and the lead uh, headline is introducing chat GPT. And then just go and right below that it say chat GPT sign up. You just click on that and it'll get you to a Q and a where it tells you how do I sign up for chat GPT and you just follow the instructions. Very simple. You're just like making an account and it gives you all sorts of disclaimers and then you, you have availability. And you can, you can talk to it by using the microphone uh, in the app, and it will print out your question. <laughs> so you can just do natural language questions, and then you hit the little button that says, you know, send, and, and then and immediately it'll start coming back to you. Now, what you're going to find, it's probably what I found this weekend, which is a lot of my questions this was unable to answer because it doesn't have data. Mm -hmm. It's not optimized for financial data. And I read, um, and I don't know how true this is, but I think it's, it's probably pretty true from what I'm seeing, that this natural language app, chat GPT, is not optimized for financial data at all. And therefore, it doesn't really know how to go in and get information out of a 10K and compile that in some way that would be useful. But so that's what that I want to know when come. you said, when you said, um, you asked it something like, does this have a competitive niche? What did it give? What did it say? What was its answer? I mean, it gave me little paragraphs on five companies and I haven't, that's as far as I got this weekend. I had to go to a hound show. Okay. So I was <laughs> Fair busy enough. All weekend. But and I, I will look those up and I will tell you. Next Were they week. real companies? <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even know. I've never heard of any of them. Which doesn't well, mean let's anything, have a little fun this caps. week with Chat GPT, and then we'll come back and tell everybody. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what, you guys went. can play along if you want to. Um, let me see if. Well, while you're looking, I just want to not forget we got this email, and I just want to acknowledge the people who sent in emails about Vista Outdoors and the outdoors industry. And we just really appreciate your time and you guys sending us info when we ask for it it's so great and i particularly wanted to thank stephen housley who wrote to us he works in the outdoor industry hi stephen and i just wanted to say that so stephen works in the outdoor industry and he basically said what you said dad about uh about the industry and the numbers in particular so i'm just going to quickly read some of stephen's email and then We'll go back to the chat GPT. So guys, this is about Vista Outdoor, which we spent the last couple episodes talking about outdoor industry company. So what Steven says is that from 2022 into 23, um, or sorry, 2021 to 2022 were great. 2022 into 23, forecasts have been aggressively reduced and consumers are moving to off-price industries. So retailers are absolutely full up with full price inventory which is hindering profits therefore and this is what we talked about while numbers in the outdoor industry might look great if averaging with the last two years i would be hesitant to assign that same growth curve in the next three to five years so i just wanted to thank you Stephen, and i just wanted to let everybody know that in case you're doing your own research on the outdoor industry and vista outdoor and thanks for all your emails they were really really helpful okay that done now okay back back to chat gpt back to chat real GPT. quick yeah okay so here's a little homework for you guys um i asked at this i said please list the five best public companies with the following qualities high and growing roa high and growing roic high and growing roe low debt high and growing free cash flow Jeez, and a really... durable market niche you really went for it oh yeah 
Okay, and here's the response. As an AI language model, I don't have access to real-time financial data or market analysis. <laughs> However, I can provide you with a list of five companies that have historically demonstrated high ROE, ROE, ROIC, low debt, high and growing free cash flow, and a durable market niche. Please note, this is not investment advice. <laughs> I highly recommend conducting your own research and consulting a financial advisor before well, making any investment decisions. Well, we agree decisions. with ChatGPT on one thing. It's got a lawyer. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the list. Alphabet. And it says, and I'll just read you what it says. Alphabet is a multinational technology conglomerate that specializes in internet related services and products. The company has a strong market position in online search, digital advertising, and cloud computing. Alphabet has consistently demonstrated high ROE, ROA, ROIC, low debt, strong free cash flow. Okay. Gonna, what are the I'll other four? The rest of them. Yeah. MasterCard. MA. Interesting. Intuitive Surgical. ISRG. These are the guys that make the Da Vinci. Uh, uh, what do they call it? It's like we you just poke a little needle in your knee or a little hole in your knee, and they can go in and Arth scope arthroscopic, it out. arthroscopic. Yeah, arthroscopic surgery. So they they've got the best systems, and once a hospital has them, they're locked in. Surgical robotics is what they do. Um, Adobe. You know, software company that does all the multimedia creativity. I can't take stuff. notes because my note taking thing isn't working. Okay, and Alphabet waste management. Mastercard. Okay. Mastercard. Intuitive Surgical. Intuitive Surgical. That's, that's I S R G. Okay. Adobe. A D B. Adobe. All right. And waste management. Oh, waste um, management. That's, that's collect transfer that's been around. disposal. Yeah. Garbage. Right. Garbage collection. Well, they're all very standard picks except for the surgical one. No, that one's pretty. They're, they're on our list. Every one of these things is on our short list of companies we'd like to own. Cool. And with the exception of Google, none of them, well, no, none of them are even remotely close to being on sale. Google got yeah. is, is, has gotten a little close, but we would love to own these all. Um, so I give, I give thumbs, two thumbs up to chat GPT for, for picking these guys, right? Um, I then asked ChatGPT what to get my wife for her birthday. <laughs> I just wonder I if we put it into cool. Google. You didn't hear what I said? That was funny. I, I heard it. Yeah, it that was funny. Was funny. <laughs> that was you a dad joke. Laugh. It was such a dad joke. <laughs> it was good. All right, let's end on a high note. <laughs> okay. Um, let me see. I was thinking one more thing. Okay, these might be something else to check out. These are mid caps below two billion with strong growth potential. HubSpot, which I'm very interested in. Wait, did this really come up in the same on. list or in a different? No, nope, different list, different question. Okay. Um, but we just have we're just integrating HubSpot into our company now, so we pick them over Salesforce for what that's cool. worth. Mm -hmm. Chegg, C-H-G-G. -G. This is textbook rentals um, and a high growth rate. MongoDB, um, software company that does document-oriented database. Trade Desk, digital advertising that enables ad buyers to, to uh, manage their campaigns across various channels. And Appfolio, which is a cloud-based software for property management and and law firms so those are really interesting they're all very fast growers with very high co uh, compounded annual growth rates interesting um, most will you say that list one more time sure just for everybody HubSpot, trying to write it down hubspot hubspot has a three-year kegger of 38 percent per year that's freaking crazy Chegg, C H E G G. That's C H G G is its symbol. They're over thirty percent. MongoDB is M D B, with fifty six percent Kager over the last three years. Trade Desk has a Kager of fifty one percent. That's T T D, and Appfolio's A P P F, which uh, has a Kager of over thirty percent. And wow. the reason I was plugging for those, and then we'll let you guys go. The reason I was looking around for something like that is that we're targeting a 26% compounded annual growth rate in the companies we want to own. And the way that we do that 
and I've done that throughout my career, is to wait for something to go on sale, which means half off intrinsic value. And when I buy that and it goes back up to intrinsic value, it doubles. And if it does that in three years, it's a 26% return. And it often does it much faster than that. Now, the limitations of that are that once a company's back up to its intrinsic value, then the growth rate is whatever the growth rate is of revenue and earnings from that point on. And if that turns out to be 4% a year, your money velocity just went flat. Mm -hmm. So these companies have got internal growth rates that are stunning. I mean, their revenue is growing at compound annual growth rates. It's huge, which means if we can buy them on sale, we get that wonderful leap back up to intrinsic value. And then the company itself, we can just sit in. And that's really nirvana. That's where you want to buy a company and you don't sell it. Yeah. Because it can compound your money at a very high rate forever. Or yeah. not forever, but for a long time. So let's talk more about that next time. Okay. Sounds good. Until Thanks, then, everybody. Time to go play. Bye. Bye. Hi, guys. Thanks for listening to Invested. If you enjoyed this episode and you want more information or to listen to additional episodes, visit our website at investedpodcast.com and sign up for my virtual workshop right there. Spots are definitely limited for this event. I'm not kidding. They really are. They sell out very quickly. So everything discussed on this podcast, by the way, is either my opinion or it's Danielle's opinion. And it's really important. It's not to be taken as investing advice because I am not your financial advisor, nor have I considered your personal situation as your fiduciary. So remember that. You're on your own here. This podcast is for your entertainment and education only. And I really hope you enjoyed it.